Hello, everyone. We welcome you as you file into today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast sponsored by Ideagen. Wanted to let you know you are in the right place. Just going to allow about another minute or so for everyone to get filed in. But again, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Again, we say hello and welcome you. You are in the right place. This is the Safety and Health Magazine webinar sponsored by Ideagen. Just going to allow another 30 seconds or so for everyone to get filed in. We'll get going in about that time. Thank you. All right, well, an official hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Riding the Wave, Ocean Spray's Digital EHS Journey, sponsored by Ideagen. My name is Kevin Drulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and we'll be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well. In a few minutes, we'll start a presentation, but first, let's review some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and may not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not necessarily mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the Send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. At the end of this webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and we'll let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today are Nick Marquardt and Gordon McEwen. Nick serves as Corporate Safety Manager at Ocean Spray, and he brings more than 15 years of EHS experience and has been an integral member of two OSHA Voluntary Protection Program certifications. Gordon is Global Vice President of Product Marketing at Ideagen. He has a background in governance, risk, and compliance software, and advocates for safer, healthier, more sustainable workplaces while helping organizations to understand, digitalize, and improve their EHS processes. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Nick and Gordon, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and take it away. Hey, thanks, Kevin. And hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar. So not long ago, Ocean Spray decided to establish a global environmental health and safety system to better find and eliminate risk. Once launched, the eSafe program transformed their safety culture. So Nick, hello. And what does safety culture mean at Ocean Spray? And what's the connection with your OSHA compliance program? Uh, good morning, Gurdon. Uh, thank you for everybody for joining. Um, you know, really, the question about culture is, I think, the linchpin of a safety program. Um, culture is the engagement with your team, whether it's leadership or hourly. It's the engagement with different partners, whether it's OSHA, contractors. Um, but the culture is truly, how do you look at your safety program? Is it just something you do in a cost of business? Or is it truly the nature of what you do? Um, you know, and I would say at Ocean Spray, the culture that we had even prior to this change was very healthy. We had a very good idea of what a culture should be, but this just helped us take the next step because it made us smarter about what we were doing. Um, and it helped develop that culture so that we could prove, number one, we had a good culture, but number two, what were those methods we needed to take to truly make that culture something that just existed because it was there? Yeah, so it, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. In that old saying, and it's it's the behaviors, it's how people behave, it's how people think about safety rather than necessarily just straight compliance. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you have an employee come to work and they believe that they're a part of the program and that what they do matters apart from just pressing a button uh, yeah. or an ocean spray's case, you know, putting juice in a bottle, um, when they know that they're important, they know that their leaders and their partners out on the production floor care for them and are actively looking for their safety, that is what breeds the culture. And then it becomes a question of, 
I'm not doing this because I'm supposed to. I'm doing this because I know at the end of the day, I will go home along with all of my other partners. And that's truly where the culture comes in is that each person looks at themselves as their own individual safety manager. Um, and it's not a, it's not a got you. It's not trying to catch somebody doing something wrong. It's, I truly care for you. And I want you to have the same success that I do. So part of the, um, the impetus for this, this conversation, this webinar is that, you know, you've had a program over the last few years, uh, a transformation program at Ocean Spray, um, your ESIF program. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what that is? When, when did it begin and, and what was, what was the trigger? What was, what was it that needed to be accomplished, needed to be changed? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So when we're, when we're talking about our safety program at Ocean Spray, uh, really it was over about the last three and a half or four years um, that we truly invested in this. Uh, you know, as I said, we had a really strong safety culture prior. Um, the, the location that I was actually the safety manager at uh, was a VPP site. So for those that don't know, the VPP is the voluntary protection program provided by the by OSHA. Uh, and in 2018, our location was VPP certified. So that in and of itself kind of tells you what the culture was like at that location, if you do know about VPP. Uh, but one of the things that we realized is VPP asks about above and beyond practices. How do you get better every day? How do you prove that you're getting better? And one of the things that we had realized was that Prior to eSafe, um, everything that we had was very manual. It was documentation, it was filing cabinets. And in order to get that data, it was hours and hours and hours of research to truly sift through all of that and try to make sense of it. And we thought, you know, we've got all of our programs developing to be world class. We've got very low incident rates, we've got people engaged in the process, but the way we manage those processes were really antiquated. And so for us, developing eSafe to what it is currently helped us not only get that data, make sense of it, but also apply it in a timely fashion. So when we could see that a risk existed, rather than it taking a week or two or whatever that might that time frame might be, we were able to get that information out in sometimes minutes to, to hours. Um, and we could share that with a network of folks rather than just silo it within a you know one location. So that truly was kind of the genesis of how do we make our program world-class along with our performance? And that's really where eSafe was that linchpin for us. So you, you wanted to improve your, your safety intelligence, um, you know, better, so, well, I suppose digitalizing your management of SOPs and policies, being more audit ready, um, managing behavioral safety and, and incidents and so on. and. Did you go from a previously sort of manual world of what was it like? Was it ring binder files and Xerox reporting forms and Excel spreadsheets? I mean, what 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 were you using back in 20, 2017? Yeah, that that's then absolutely it. Centralized. <laughs> yeah. Um, everything that you just said is is a yes. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was Xerox copies of a document, whether it was the oldest document we had or the newest. It was people doing things actively on a piece of paper, putting things in a binder or a file cabinet. Um, when we would do our behavioral safety processes, we were getting anywhere from probably two to 250 documents um, every month. And sometimes, you know, you would get 50 or 60 documents in a week. And now you're trying to take all of that handwritten documentation and you're transferring it into an Excel spreadsheet so that you could then try to filter it and file it and understand what was happening. And yeah. then share all that information out um, if, if you could keep on top of the documentation. And anybody in safety knows that you sit on, in some cases, thousands of pieces of paper and documentation and management of that is sometimes the nightmare. Um, you know, in and I guess, I guess, yeah, visibility is a challenge because when, when processes are manual, people tend to do them less. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, so, so because they're time consuming and you know what, I won't bother with that one because it's not super important. Um, but when you've digitalized it and made it easy, people do it more. So would you say that your sort of situational awareness of safety has improved significantly? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the unique things that we had done in our locations is 
made our behavioral safety process electronic, not only just by using eSafe, but we've also put tablets out on our production floor. And so right. when an employee sees a risk or they see something happening, they can immediately go to that tablet and start documenting that. If they didn't have that piece of paper earlier, it would mean I'd have to stop what I was doing, go get that piece of paper and then start documenting it. So it truly has made awareness something completely different because they're available to put that message out immediately and it's shared immediately. So all of our leadership gets it. Our maintenance staff would get it. And it was oftentimes a correction that we could make immediately rather than I submitted my my observation last week and we're finally getting to a hazard and, and now it's been a hazard for a week. Um, you know, so it truly has made the entire process far more efficient and far faster to correct and identify hazards. Okay, well, I'd really like to ask you a little bit more about that. For example, how you're managing behavioral safety observations, but let's take let's take a pause for a minute because I think that leads into our first poll question quite nicely, um, which is how does your organization manage safety? Gene, could you uh, put up the first poll? Thank you. I think we're gonna take about 30 seconds while you guys uh, submit your answers, which will then be shared with you. Wow. Now that's interesting. You see, that surprises me, Nick. I mean, are, are you surprised by that? <laughs> I, you know, I am a little bit. Um, but at the same time, I think, uh, you know, safety is one of those departments that always talks about just because this is how we've always done it in the past doesn't make it the best. But a lot of times we get stuck into that. Well, this is just how we've always done our behavioral based safety program. This is how we've always kept documentation or managed it. So why why necessarily would that change? How would that change? Um, so to see the number of people still doing it pen and paper, yeah, that doesn't surprise me because that's kind of the easy button. That's what we've always been doing. Um, then you've got the silo piece, and it's it, it, it yeah it it explains it, but it is it is still interesting. Maybe it's just because I I work in the software industry. I think we we live in a digitally transformed world, and. It is surprising to me that people are still managing business critical processes with paper and, and Excel, but there it is. <laughs> Listen, thank you everyone for, for, for doing that. So yeah, Nick, ba back to your um, your processes and, and how they've changed. So things like, um, you know, corporate safety audits, behavioral safety observations, um, safety reporting and the way that that's democratized to, to across your organization. Um, you know, can we talk about that a little bit? But let's let's take behavioral safety organization uh, BSOs. I mean, yes. how are you managing those these days? So right now, everything is electronic. Um, we have rolled that out across all of our locations, um, and the benefit to that is I can then take information from the East Coast and share it with West, West Coast locations or with Central America, you name it. So we have truly a global presence in safety management of our data. Um, it has made it super easy because if, again, if you walk around, everybody knows how to use a phone. I mean, from, you know, people that didn't grow up with phones, it's just, it's a natural thing. Um, the number of tablets you see out there, it's just now something that people are comfortable with. So again, part of being, I think, a good safety person and having a good culture is making it easy for people to do the things that you want them to do. And so mm -hmm. one of those things is rather than forcing you to get a clipboard and go get a piece of paper, you have a tablet right there at your workstation. You can carry it with you. You're having a conversation. It's a natural inclination for people to use a tablet anyway. So it also makes the BSO a little fun because you're now interacting with it. Um, and what I have found personally for myself and for others is that when I was using a piece of paper, I was concentrating on what does the piece of paper say and what am I finding that matches those questions? Can you, can you help us color this in a little bit for us? Yeah. Can you help us Can you help us visualize what this looks like at Ocean Spray? So I've been drinking Ocean Spray since I was a little kid, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and I imagine that you guys have, you know, you're probably this time of year, you've got a big harvest going on people bringing berries in from the the berry bushes. I and mean, 
Well, get, paint a picture of what a typical BSO scenario would be like. I mean, okay. what, who, who, are, who are you observing? What are they yeah. doing? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, so one of the really important parts, and I think this is really the um, uh, one of the linchpins of a good, healthy behavioral safety process, and that is honesty and transparency. So the first thing is a BSO, in my opinion, can be performed by anybody that works at your organization. And I truly believe that your leadership should demonstrate the ability to do that behavioral safety observation and live by those findings as well. So for, for us, the way we do this is every person in a building is encouraged to do an observation. And the way we would do that is we would go out to the production floor and I see any employee working. And part of that open and honest, transparent part of the process is I would wanna make sure that that person knows what I'm there for. I would say, Gordon, hey, what are you doing today? I'm putting caps in a, in a capper. Hey, do you mind if I watch what you're doing? I'm gonna do a, an, ob an observation you know why I'm there now. I don't want this to be subversive. I don't want to hide behind a column and take notes because that doesn't build that trust. For me, it's very important that a BSO collects data about where our risk exists, but it's also important for me to develop a safe conversation about safety. When, when you and I have that honesty and that transparency, I can now come out in the future and you know, Nick isn't going to come out here just to try to find things that I'm doing wrong. He's actively looking out for my safety and vice versa, right? And so we have employees that feel empowered now to watch leadership and say, hey, just be careful. I'm going to be putting water on the floor over here. It's going to be slippery while I clean this up. Can you guys just stay out of the area for a while? They feel empowered to have that conversation. And it's not like, oh, here's the leaders. I can't say anything that, you know, they, they can mm -hmm. do no wrong. So it develops that relationship. And that's where your culture starts to develop is that people know I'm part of a program that cares for me, whether you're the plant manager or you're the newest employee in the production for facility. So that's the open and honest transparency part. Uh, the old process, we would have roughly 25 to 30 questions and it would be anything from, are you wearing your PPE correctly? To, are you locking out if necessary? Um, are you keeping slip hazards off the floor? So again, you would, you would read the question and you would look out on the floor and say, no, I don't see any slip hazards. And then you would mark that off. But your concentration, I found, was always on that piece of paper. What mm, I found yeah. now by moving it to an electronic means is I am spending far more time watching what's happening, kind of documenting the hazards that I'm seeing or the good practices so that when I do a feedback, right, as soon as that observation is done, I want that employee to know what did we find? And I always lead with the good things. What are you doing well? What do we want you to continue to do really well? Let them know. And then when you transition to talking about those opportunities, you know, we never want to use the word but. So there's a really easy way to have that conversation and say, Gordon, your area is super clean. You don't have any hoses on the ground. I also noticed that your fire extinguisher was sitting on the ground. Did you all use that or is that where you normally keep it? So I've just asked you about a hazard in a non-threatening way. And you're like, oh, no, yeah, we were just using it for a hot work program. I just need to put it back on. I have now called out a risk and it, you don't feel like it's a direct threat. But the other part of this is by asking you to do a, an observation, I'm putting some power back in your hand. You have the ability to say no, but you know what I'm out there for. So you're, I've never had a person say, no, you can't do an observation. They know what I'm there for. And now it's that conversation and that's what builds it. So that when I give them that feedback, they now, they, we've had a conversation. It's not just, Nick or somebody else telling me what I've done wrong. So for me, that's kind of a very quick synopsis of how an observation process goes. Um, and then with it being electronic, all of that data is automatically managed. So, so th 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 that's th that's really interesting that you find it less of a barrier. P paper is more of a barrier between you and the, the colleague that you're observing than than than. Uh, a, a, a cell phone or, or or an iPad that that, that is interesting I mean, and you mentioned the level of engagement of shop floor, floor colleagues in the safety culture has has improved does that is that reflected in the volume of incident reporting or you know the reporting of near misses if I'm if I'm working if I'm you know I'm in your plant I'm putting mm -hmm. the caps on the on the bottles um are uh, your colleagues reporting uh, situations, non-conformances, near misses, issues more than they were before? Absolutely. 
Uh, and I think the part of that is that the level of awareness has changed. Um, again, you know, very much like an observation or anything else where you did it on a piece of paper, there can be an incident. And now that supervisor or that lead is out at the incident scene, putting that information into a tablet. It's done right there instantaneously. They can take pictures with the tablet and upload that immediately. So you don't truly have to have a kit any longer with your measuring tape and all of these different elements because you've got it all built into your tablet. Um, right. You know, our leaders carry their tablets with them. So whether it's a production issue, a quality issue, a safety issue, you name it, they've got that tablet as their one source of truth for everything happening. And so, yes, it has made incident reporting significantly easier. But I think the other part of this is when you start marrying these systems together, you're finding risk through your observation processes at a higher rate. So you're reducing that risk before it ever becomes a problem. So when you do have a near miss reported, it is truly a one-off situation. Um, so to answer your question though, we absolutely do see a huge increase in the amount of near miss reporting. You know, and I think that's part of the process too and, and a development of that culture where people understand that reporting a near miss or reporting a minor injury or, or anything for that matter, doesn't mean that you're unsafe. It means that you're you're documenting the things that are happening every day. You're learning from those and finding solutions for those. So, so what, what what what's the scale of that improvement in in reporting? Is that is that two times, three times? I mean, how much more uh, data are you getting now than than before yeah. you digitalized the process? Yeah, when we so I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, but I can tell you when I did the math, we were about two to three times more reporting now with eSafe okay. electronic means than we were originally. Um, so, so you got you you got more you, you now have more data, and it's also centralized. So, I mean, what what do you do with that data? I mean, is it do you find it useful? Do you use it for any particular purpose? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, our our teams uh, are regularly in in conference calls. Um, we have a biweekly call with with a certain division of our corporation. And we're always sharing data there. Uh, one of the first things we do is our corporate audits are rolled into the eSafe program right now as well. And so when we have an audit, we immediately want to share out best practices. That's for mm. everybody in the corporation to see. If you can oh, get wow. better at it, we want you to know about it. Um, so we do that. Um, but yes, sharing the data, whether it's risk injuries, whether it is you know near misses, otherwise, if we see that there's a potential, we want that data out there. So yes, we we do communicate that in in various different channels, right? So so if you if you make an improvement, if you if you make a data driven improvement in one corner of your organization, you're then empowered to drive that out across the whole organization. That's something you couldn't have done before, right? Oh no, you know for yeah. for instance, you know you mentioned it at the start of the conversation that that yes, this time time of year we are in harvest. That's where we collect all of our cranberries, and we we were doing an audit. And we found that there was a potential risk and we were able to, because of eSafe and, and other uses of the program, we were able to get that risk identified and communicate it out to the other locations that would have that same risk the exact same day. And within a 24 hour turnaround, every single shift knew about this risk and had communicated it to their teams at various locations. Prior to that, if we had, if we had gotten it out of one location alone, we could have probably not gotten all the information to that one team in 24 hours, let alone, you know, six other locations or eight other locations. That, that's that's really interesting. Now, let's let's take a pause for a second and do another poll. Um, I, I know that you know many of our customers. One of one of their main goals is to increase their level of 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 incident reporting and safety. But uh, I think this this poll question is: What is your biggest safety management challenge? So let's take another 30 seconds and see what uh, what the audience thinks. Wow, that's interesting. This is, I do love these poll questions. <laughs> you can't beat some data. It all, you know, it illustrates the point. Absolutely. So, 
the biggest issue, and I think we probably have a professional safety management uh, group of people listening into us today, um, and they're saying that the biggest challenge is procedural inconsistencies and colleagues not following process. Uh, what's what's your what's the ocean spray take on that, Nick? What do you think of that? You're you're always, I mean, in safety, you're you're trying to get adults to make the best decision for themselves at all times. Uh, when you're in manufacturing, and and I myself worked as you know an operator on a line making paper towel earlier in my career, I know what that's like. You want to get out and you want to put out cases. Production is what you see. That's the value that you get. Safety itself doesn't generate revenue, except for when it does, because an injury, right, is cost to the, the, the organization. So to answer this question, I think you have to look at what the value of safety really is. And I think this is also where the culture piece is truly developed. So at Ocean Spray, one of the expectations is that it doesn't matter if, again, you are the plant manager or you are the, the newest person on the team, you're held to the same expectations. So when we talk about performing observations, we want everybody to be involved with that. When it comes to incident investigations, we want people to be involved with that so they can share that with their teams or the leadership or other locations. Um, and if you've got folks that are not following policy, protocol, SOPs, whatever you have, that in and of itself is an indicator of where your culture is, that they don't value that enough to make that the priority. So. You know, a part of that is the the why behind the what. Why are mm -hmm. we asking you to do this? Why did we switch from paper to electronic means? Why is this value put on uh, an observation? Why is your information that you give me imperative to making you safer? And when teams understand that and they believe that you're truly um, you're truly prioritizing that data for them. That's where people start believing in, okay, this is the reason I do this and I want to do this because that gives me the best outcome. I want to do this task this way because not only is it the safest, but hey, I also benefit my quality processes as well. Oh, and I've also made it easier to do more cases or whatever that, that measure is. So everything benefits from that compliance to what the expectations are. Yeah, and, and I wonder if, yes, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I wonder if um, easiness is part of it as well. I wonder if this is connected to the first question, um, which was not my intention, by the way. But, you know, just when I when I see that in the first poll, uh, a majority of it was what, 43, 44 percent were saying we still use paper and Excel. Paper and Excel is difficult. You know, if 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 I notice a you know a small issue and I have to go and go to the super's office and and take one of those Xerox forms and fill it out and then bring it back and you know that's a bit of a chore. You're in the world of compliance being a chore there. Whereas, and that, and and I've just painted a picture there where I am that colleague who's not following process because it's a chore. I, I wonder if there's an, an element of that. Uh, I'm almost Absolutely. certain it would be. Yeah, you yeah. know, I believe that that is that regardless of the level of effort, that's the easy button because that's what we've been doing for years and years and years. Mm. There is a level of energy that it takes to develop a program to say, hey, we are going to completely radically change how we do our safety management. To go from a completely paper based program to a completely electronic, you are changing your culture. Um, you are asking people to do something differently. Yeah. So, that transition does take a lot of energy at the beginning. And that's why it's important to have a really good team that is engaged with that process because that can make it considerably easier. But yes, to answer your question, that's why people stay with paper and Excel is that's what we've been doing. And but yes, that, it takes a long time, but... Yeah, but you're then stuck in that world. And that's the transformation, isn't it? The transformation is from a world where uh, compliance is is a chore it's it's a bit of a headache, and uh, you know the 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 safety professionals are kind of like school teachers a little bit um, to a world where actually it's not about compliance and and the tasks of compliance. It's actually it's about safety, and and I care about safety. Yes. You know, I'm part of, I'm part of a group of people that we care for each other, we look out for each other, and we look after ourselves and our environment and our organization, and we care about that. It's more yeah. it's a values based thing. Yeah. 
and I think sometimes it's it's a, a matter a matter of semantics, but it really to me means something. You know, one of the things that I truly believe now is the transition that we've had since going to eSafe is I really look at now that I do safety, not manage safety. Mm. So it allows me to focus on what are we actually doing rather than oh, this policy isn't updated yet. I have to go and rewrite this and then go and train everybody. With an electronic means, I get it done and I share it. And now everybody is seeing that. That's that's the new thing, right? You know, your SOPs can be electronically provided, your policies. And now when a change happens, yes, you're still communicating it. But rather than just trying to stay on top of something, you're actively being proactive about your program. And that is where you see change in this in the success, change in the attitudes and change in that culture that drives that performance in all aspects of the business. So, I mean, the, the, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. I mean, can we talk a little bit about OSHA compliance? And yeah. um, because, uh, you know, before you digitalized your safety management processes, you conformed to OSHA requirements and you still do. How has that changed? I mean, what, what, what's, how has your experience of, of, of that relationship with OSHA and yeah. audits and how you get through all of that? How has that changed? What's, what's the before and after story there? It, it is night and day. I will tell you that that's just the easiest answer. Um, prior, you know, I, I've been fortunate to, to be a part of two different elements of VPP. Um, I worked at a location and was part of the group that achieved VPP. And then I've been a part of an organization that they got it. And then I was part of that organization for the recertification. So I got to see kind of both elements. The initial certification process, it's it's super laborious. You At that point in time, same situation, we're collecting documents and you're sitting literally on thousands of pieces of paper. You know, one of the one of the things that I commonly tell folks is if you don't have something that proves you're doing what you say you're doing to OSHA, you're not doing it. So it was, do you have a document that shows, hey, these employees have been trained in this process. Here's the information that they were actually given. Here is a sign in sheet that says these are all of the employees that were trained in the past. That would have to be multiple pieces of paper. Now, with an electronic means. It's literally an electronic file and it all goes in one repository. So getting ready for a VPP or other um, audit process like that, again, you're usually getting out bankers boxes and files and it takes you copious amounts of time to get that developed. What's nice with an electronic means is you go through your file and you click and drag and you put it in a Dropbox and you, you say, okay, here's what you need. And so from, from initial certification that I was experiencing to recertification, the asks weren't weren't different. They want to see mm-hmm. everything. But, you know, in our recertification in 2021, we submitted that I'm, I'm estimating over over 3000 individual documents, but they were submitted electronically. So I didn't need an auditor on site going through each individual pieces piece of paper. They could do that from their offices. When they did come to the site, it was about physical findings, walking through the facility saying, are you exemplifying through practice what we read through policy and procedure? So again, that transition made it where, you know, our audit went very well. I mean, again, we had very high expectations or have high expectations in that facility, but OSHA can now come in and really focus on what makes us better because they've already done that validation. So it has truly decreased the amount of time that you have to have those folks on site. But at the same time, it also builds the relationship that you have. They know you're prepared and ready. They have no question that Ocean Spray has their documentation in place. They know what they're doing and they are advancing their program. So you probably get more from the relationship with them than you previously did. They they were coming to mark your they were marking your homework before, but now you're you have a more kind of two way relationship. You you're getting more from it. We're getting more from it, but I think it's also interesting in that, you know, the, for those that have not ever experienced VPP, you know, you get a lot of the, you are crazy. Why would you ever invite OSHA into your facility? Well, it's because we've developed a relationship with them that they know we're trying to do the right thing. We are going for world-class. World-class is that everybody goes home in the exact same condition they got to work. And so the relationship is twofold in that we can ask for help if there's a question that we have. But there's also, 
And one of the things that we press on all the time is best practices. Everybody learns best by telling people what they do well and what you want to continue to see. So for us, we go to OSHA and we say, what are you seeing elsewhere? What can benefit us? How do we get better? And they will do the same thing for us. They'll say, hey, this company is asking for a process. You guys do it really well. How can we get that information to them? How do we share that? So for me, I don't really care what your name is on the basket of the vest or who pays your paycheck. I want you to go home safely. So whether you're a contractor, a visitor, uh, a guest from another location coming to tour our facility, I want you and your employees just as safe as I want our employees. So anything we can share through OSHA or directly from us, that's what we want. And that's what makes everybody better. You know, that, that, that's, it, that, that's so interesting to me. I mean, over, over, over the past 10 years, I've had the privilege of, you know, sitting down, having a conversation like this with, you know, um, you know, safety directors at airlines and, um, you know, uh, senior pharmacists at, uh, you know, hospital um, pharmacies where they make their own gen uh, generic drugs and so forth. And it, it is, it's actually always the same thing. And it's about the relationship with their respective regulator mm -hmm. is that it's things like audit preparedness, you know, so um, an actual level of comfort of the, you know, the safety officer concerned in that sense of knowing that you're ready for the audit mm -hmm. and it's you're not going to be sitting there sweating because no matter what the auditor asks for you can just bring it up um you know in the system rather than having to you know run next door and rifle through some boxes that you hadn't brought through onto the table this time sure. and the first time i had this conversation was was with a head of safety at an airline who, who called it safety intelligence that's why i still i still love that term because he said, you know, before we implemented this system, uh, when you were dealing with auditors, you were running around with three or four files and your fingers in different places in the file so you didn't yes. lose your place. But it, 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 it's really the same story, isn't it? It absolutely is. And, you know, again, we're always, you know, we're humans. We want to find ways to make things easier. You know, part of it, my wife always jokes with me, she's like, you're always fiddling with how you do things to make it faster and make it easier and make it better, you know, and, and that's, that's true. But then I've also got the safety piece of this to say, well, how do I cut some corners, but not cut the safety. And so if I can make a process mm -hmm. easier for myself or somebody else, I've now made your job better. Well, so, you make it more effective that way. You, if you always think if you make something, you know, don't make things more difficult for people, make them easier. Right. And, and that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's part a, of being a good manager, right? Yes. <laughs> Right. And that's a unique perspective. If you can take a production minded background and understand the difficulties and then say, but we also have the safety element we want to marry in there. Not only does it show you understand what I'm telling you, but you're also finding a way to make my life easier and safer. And when you can do that and truly going to, you know, a, a safety intelligence type of mentality that has truly changed it. And now an employee says, I don't need to take the extra five minutes to go off of the production floor to get all the materials. I'm in the middle of my process. I have what I need immediately available. I can still keep doing what I'm doing. I can keep an eye on my line. My production stays going, but I have the ability to focus on my safety elements as well. So we have removed those steps and we have made their jobs safer and we have made their jobs easier. So I would absolutely say that that's an imperative. I want to ask you a little bit about how you brought everyone with you on that journey, but let, let's just get our final poll. I think we had three polls. So Gene, if we can have that, that third poll up, it's a really simple one. How do you rate the effectiveness of your current safety program? Pretty important question. <laughs> Partially effective. Wow. Good. Now I wish we had another poll that said why. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Should have thought of that one. <laughs> oh my goodness! Why does such an uh, such a significant majority of respondents consider that their safety program is only partially effective? 
I wonder if that's connected to it not being, you know, being low safety intelligence. I don't know. What 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 do you think that might be, Nick? You know, I think from my perspective, um, I think it's one of those things. A, a lot of it for me would be around documentation, and that is, am I truly getting the best information? Am I getting the information out to the people that need it? Is it going out in a timely fashion? Um, you know, much to the question of are people being compliant, part of that is have I effectively trained them to the new expectations based off and of do, the data that we found? Do, do they have do they have the correct version of a particular operating procedure or, or policy? Yeah, I know. I mean, that that's that's certainly a, a root cause of many industrial accidents over. Yeah, you know, but I think this, in a variety yeah. of industries. Mm. I think this is also a question. You know, you can go to any manager that I've ever talked to that does safety says the same thing. And that is, I want to spend my time on the floor looking for hazards and making the jobs better. I don't want to be sitting in an office putting files away, right? And so, because filing doesn't inherently make us safer. And so that's part of this uh, dilemma that we have is that while yes, the, the filing is super important to, to be audit ready, Right. It does take us away from the floor. So I think for me as an as an EHS manager, when I felt like I wasn't fully effective, that that was the problem is I am not I don't feel like I'm getting the information out to the people that need it. Um, you know, am I truly making sure that they understand the why behind what we're doing? Um, do they do they believe in and buy into the program? Are they part of the culture? You know, and I think this is one of those questions where you know, culture is, is again, so much of what you do. Um, you know, we, th there's a program that we have called hiring for attitude. And I, I always believe that you can teach people a skill, but you can't always teach them an attitude. And so, you know, part of that is bring those people in that want to be a part of the program that are excited about learning and doing. And it makes, it makes, it takes that partially effective a little bit higher because, you're seeing that evidenced by what these folks are doing because they are engaged in your program. So I, I'm, I'm still struck by that partially effective thing. You know, what would you, this is a different question from the one I was, I was gonna, I, want, I, do, I do wanna ask you about the change management thing and we've got a little bit of time, but for those peers, those colleagues in safety management who maybe feel that they're, uh, their program, their system is partially effective. I mean, what, what what's your advice? I mean, you're 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 clearly very happy uh, and successful in in what what you've done at at Ocean Spray. Well, what's your advice to to your peers who may, are maybe considering their partially effective system and what to do about that? Where do you start? You know, I I think the the first place is making sure that your teams are all aligned. I think you know it. A lot of a lot of what we do um, in Ocean Spray, but a lot of the places that I've worked in the past, it has to truly be a top-down priority that everybody feels that safety is an imperative, right? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that my plant manager sings the same song that I do, that they're looking for hazards. And I think when when employees know that my leadership team supports me, they believe in this, it makes it a lot easier for them to go along with it. But I think it's also important when your leadership um, demonstrates that out on the production floor, they're wearing their PPE, they're following the procedures, they're actively asking, how can I make your life better? How can I make it safer? You know, getting the getting the start of a really good culture is the most important piece. Um, I will tell you, there are still days that I walk into a facility and I'm like, oh my goodness, we are so far behind. But then you start talking and you see the engagement and you see people asking questions. And you're like, oh, what, what am I thinking? No, we're we're doing the right things. So mm -hmm. I think part of it is, um, you know, the old adage of how do you eat an elephant? You know, it's that one bite at a time. You know, find out where your gap is. What is your biggest gap? And put that energy there. Is it I need to update a policy? Get it updated. Once I know that that's updated, okay, now how do I truly get it out to the team? You know, and one of the things that I encourage any safety manager um, that I work with or any manager out there is I carry sign-in sheets with me. So when I go out to the production floor, if I have a conversation with people about safety and it's value added, I'm learning something, I'm training a one-point lesson, I have those people sign that sign-in sheet and I save that. 
So if somebody asks, hey, how do I know that you have talked about lockout? I can go through my lockout folder and say, here are all of the conversations that I've had with employees about lockout, training them to use the software, showing them where lockout points are, whatever that is. When you start seeing how much work you're doing, that takes your program from partially effective to more close to fully effective because you're going, mm -hmm. oh, wow, I am actually seeing what I'm doing versus feeling what I am or am not doing. So I think that's some places to start is just your own validation that you're you're moving your program forward. Very interesting. But Nick, I, I realize you, you've put a lot of effort into this. You've done a lot of the talking, but I do have one more question. So yeah. you, you've done a, a business transformation project, really, in the context of safety over the last five years. Um, change management is difficult. Um, frontline staff often have, you know, have, have trouble with change. I mean, do you, have you learned anything about change management in the last five years? And would you have any advice for um, your peers who might be implementing, um, you know, a safety management digitalization or transformation? Yeah. It's just in um, terms of bringing, bringing people with you. Yes. I, I would say the number one thing is find your cheerleaders, find those people that don't necessarily have to have all the answers right now, but they're on board to change. They know that change can be a good thing. Um, you know, and this is this is one of the things that I, I personally am proud of is I really embrace it. I love change mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't want to get stagnant. So if you find others in your organization that feel the same way that you're like, it doesn't matter what I say to Joe, he is always ready to go. Yeah. You know what? Let's see what we can do. Find those people and ask them for your help. So when we were when we were changing from paper to eSafe, we had a team of those people. The people that were willing to jump on board and say, okay, how do we make this successful? Right. If you run okay. into an issue, you, you, you work a way through it. And when you get those people that number one are, are willing to change and they can be your cheerleader at each of the locations, then it's just answer questions and show how you can make it effective for people. And, and, and did, just did, say, you, did you formalize that? I mean, did those guys get a sort of a designation, like a, a safety leader or, or, or was it, totally informal no it was it was truly they were identified as the team um right. you know and they went through and and we we made the selection to go with idea gen um you know and we we use the term e-safe that's just what we call our our version of of idea gen uh but we had a, a set team and we had regular meetings and we would talk about idea gen and say yep this is what we're going with and then when we were developing what we saw in IdeaGen, it was, we want this module, this module, this module. These are the questions that need to be asked. Uh, the incident investigation form, everything that we had was truly developed by this team. So now when they see the program in action, they have that level of ownership to say, I was part of this. I helped develop this. So not only are they a cheerleader for a program in general, but now they see their work in action used by, you know, Ocean Spray has over 2,000 employees. Yeah. So now there's 2,000 employees using my input every day to make our lives better. That just breeds that confidence and that this is why it's important. And those are the first steps, again, to in integrating this into your system. But again, that's also a really huge step in developing that culture. I, I can I can see that. And I guess, I guess we've all, if we're fortunate, we've seen examples of that. Um, because that enthusiasm, that's what sparks in the culture and it helps propagate it. And I know I can I can picture that. So Nick, thank you. I think we've we've completed the kind of the, the first part of our um our discussion. And we we're in the QA section now. So I've got some of the questions coming up in front of me. Um there's a couple of observations, I think, rather than questions. Um okay. uh, Gideon points out that um there's always room for improvement in safety programs, hence his partially successful full answer. Um, Stacy comments, I think this is a very, um, uh, I've, I've heard this comment many times and I think there's so much truth in it. Uh, without leadership uh, sponsorship or assistance to ensure compliance, colleagues continue to disregard policies and procedures. I guess that's kind of classic ISO 45001 you know, and you mentioned it yourself five minutes ago. Uh, leaders need to be ambassadors, you know, and sponsors of of change. Uh, safety cannot be achieved when people um, continue to violate safety rules, which is why ours is partially effective. Okay, I mean that that doesn't sound like 
yeah, uh, there's some issue there. Um, what do we got here? Uh, oh, here's a, here's a straight question from D. Uh, Nick, at Ocean Spray, do you use phone apps um, or only iPad to capture the BSO? We use both. Um, so if we have we have tablets out on the production floor, you know, for our for our line operators, maintenance leaders. Uh, but then you've also got folks that may have a phone with the um, IdeaGen app. So they they truly can do it on both, depending on the device that they have availability to. Okay. Uh, Jennifer asks, do you use QR codes? Not sure for for what so purpose. We, but... <laughs> we we have we've actually started that a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's one of those. I think that's the the next kind of burgeoning part of this, and that is how do we make it accessible? So, uh, so to answer your question, yes, we we have started um, a little bit of investigation into that process. Okay, um, Andrew asks, uh, what is the ROI? Um, what's the return on investment? I guess um, I, I would infer from that that he means, you know, what's the return on investment from digitalizing your your processes? Uh, well, I can tell you when we went from paper to IdeaGen, I went from about 10 hours a week of collecting data um, for all of our observations, the manual calculations, to about 10 minutes a day. So, you know, wow. it's running, you know, if you're wanting just an ROI on time, you know, I'm, I'm now talking. Well, that, that begs the question, what do you do with the rest of the time? <laughs> Well, and, and that's the thing is now you have far more time to go out and communicate those results. So for those people that are saying our folks aren't following processes, you can now say, hey, we've got data to say why I don't have the tool available or I don't have the training necessary. So now you're giving yourself the time to develop what you need to go out to the production floor and give them that information. And now when you start seeing those things go away, you can say, oh, now I need to ask a different question because I'm getting I'm getting the level of of action that I want to see out of this, and that's the benefit. I mean, is is it a step too far to say um, that you've moved from staying on top of compliance to now having the efficiency and effectiveness to to drive those improvements and that's and and improve your safety culture even further? Yeah, you've gone you know, I mean, compliance. Yeah, really. compliance will always be there, right? We we all know yeah. that, but yeah, you're 100 percent accurate. There's if you can get compliance to just be, that's the thing that we do regardless, then it is truly about best practices and advancing the program and how do we make this better, you know? And, and one of the things that's unique for us is we, we took idea gen and it was truly designed for our safety program only. That was the intent, but we have now got production wanting pieces of this quality wanting pieces of this. Um, our corporate leadership has access and, and view view to what's in eSafe. So it has branched out to now affect everybody in the corporation rather than just safety in a positive way. So that is truly the benefit of this is change it for everybody to make it better. We got a little bit of feedback from Jennifer. It says, thank you. Uh, QR codes would be used for hazard spotting and near miss incident reporting. Um, they, they can be used for mobile submissions integrated into digital programs. So it sounds like uh, you know, we've got a colleague there who's is maybe using a, a similar system or, or something like that. So. Yeah, one of the one of the things we're actually looking at with that is um, uses of inspections. So you can place them on ladders and do your inspection on a tablet, and now it saves the document or your it just calls the form and, straight up. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. there's a lot of really good ideas with QR codes and and again just advancement of technology. Uh, did did you encounter resistance or unwillingness to adopt the new software? You're always going to have, you know, people that are like, oh, why are we changing this, pushing back a little bit? Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is, like anything, prove to them why it's important, prove to them why a change is valued, and then you can start getting, getting them to come along. Are you going to have 100% buy-in on everything? Absolutely not. But when, when folks see that it is easier, um, they're going to be willing to come along. And for those people that that aren't going to be your cheerleaders, you know, that's, those are the outliers, but you're still making their lives better and safer because you're still getting data. So um, I would say, don't beat yourself up over the people that are, are pushing back too hard. Uh, really focus on those folks that are driving your program. And that's it. I don't think we have any more questions. So I think that kind of brings us to, 
to the end of our presentation today. Um, Nick, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you again. Gordon, and as the same goes for you? I mean, this is a, such an interesting conversation. I think it can, you know, if we were in the same place, we could take this one to the bar. But <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I can I can talk about this all day long. Like this is this is truly one of my passions. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it back to uh our our hosts at NSC and uh let's call it a day. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank yes. you. Thanks very much to the to the both of you. Great job and excellent presentation. A lot of great conversation. And I'm as you said, whether the bar or otherwise, I know you guys could could keep it going. Um <laughs> as as we do close down, just want to remind everyone that once this ends, we're going to be sending a brief evaluation survey to you. It'll pop up in a separate screen and really do appreciate your your feedback as it helps us improve future webcasts. As as indicated by by Nick and Gordon, we do appear to be out of questions. So Otherwise, would say the, the the unanswered one would would go to them, but no, we appreciate you sending those in, and I know they appreciated getting them from you. So, guys, unless you have any final thoughts, we can we can wrap it up. No, just uh, thanks to you, Kevin and Jane, and uh, the team at the council for uh, having us here today. It's it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Well, no, thank you guys both. Uh, with, with that, we will end today's safety and, and health magazine webcast. Again, want to thank. Nick Marquardt, Gordon McEwen, everyone at IdeaGen, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you all. Have a safe day.